Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm really grateful for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for coming. Uh, you know, human rights is, uh, is uh, you know, an interesting topic we will talk about, but not as hot as some other major international crisis happening out there. Although what people many times don't realize, and that includes politicians and includes politicians in the EU, is that there's virtually uh, no conflict around the world that doesn't have human rights either as its cause or as a fundamental element of its potential solution. So all those who uh, sometimes create a, uh, a conflict in the debate between promoting real politic goals, let's say, of foreign policy versus promoting human rights goals, uh, in my view, uh, tend, to, uh, tend to miss the boat, uh, certainly tend to miss the, uh, the, the correct analyses. So thank you for coming. Um, the, uh, a few years ago, a, a, a sort of a peaceful revolution happened at the European Union level regarding human rights. Uh, the 27 member states spoke uh, in one voice, and remarkably, they did not find the lowest common denominator to do so, but they found uh, the highest, one would argue, if one reads the strategic framework on human rights that the 27 member states adopted, the action plan of about 97 actions that they also adopted in parallel, with specific commitments on specific topics to promote on human rights around the world. Uh, and if one looks at their determination to appoint for the first time a EU special representative on human rights, and I was honored to, uh, uh, to be the, uh, the person that, uh, that they selected. And that's a quiet revolution because in many ways I think what the EU realized, and what and the statement that it made more to itself than to the uh, outside world, is that human rights indeed is um, uh, a crucial element of a successful foreign policy. Uh, it's a crucial element of a, a successful values policy that the EU um, uh, is promoting uh, around the world, uh, and on which values it was itself founded. Uh, and that a lot of stuff was happening on human rights, but A, more needs to happen, B, it needs to happen in a more coordinated fashion, C, it has to be more effective, and D, it has to be more visible. And so if you were to look at my mandate, it says that I have to promote the coherence, the effectiveness, and the visibility of human rights around the world. Coherence is a major challenge because it mainly addresses human rights as they are promoted by the EU. It's an internal debate. The European Commission has a number of commissioners and policies promoting human rights and a lot of money to do so. The Development Commissioner, a lot of money, a lot of programs around the world explicitly focusing on human rights or implicitly affecting them. Our development policy is a human rights policy if you were to think about it, uh, in terms of the effects that it has and can have, although no one calls it a human rights policy. There's the External Action Service, the new foreign, let's say, uh, affairs ministry of Europe, the External Action Service, which of course does diplomacy around the world with delegations on the ground in over 150 countries. Uh, there are member states themselves to go to the council level who are very active in human rights on their own accord, through their embassies, through their uh, foreign services, and, and what have you. But many times we'll do things without talking to each other. And of course, there's the European Parliament, which is an institution that has no money and no official, if you like, um, engagement in EU foreign policy, but is extremely active, a leading power in human rights, uh, in the EU and around the world, and, uh, and uh, very capable of effective international debate in the issue. And this is just the institutional framework. You also have major NGOs in Europe who do human rights and promote human rights around the world and are on the ground often in places where even the EU delegations cannot be. And how it is that one tries to coordinate, cooperate, learn from the system and make it work more effectively, the coherence of human rights policy. And when I put the NGOs in that discussion, uh, you understand, of course, I didn't put them as an EU institution. They're everything but. They're not politics. They are not political. 
But in terms of working with NGOs and the effectiveness of cooperating with NGOs, I am a um, fanatic advocate. And I think that anyone who doesn't understand the importance of discussing with NGOs, supporting what they do, in many cases protect them around the world from uh, persecution, um, doesn't get it in terms of what it means to promote human rights. Not only because human rights can be most effectively promoted in many cases by the civil society, but also because in the end of the day, it is only if human rights become the property of a society, not an outside uh, preaching or an outside imposed fact, but the property of a society itself in any difficult country around the world, only then do they have a chance of actually, you know, flourishing. So that's the coherence part of my mandate. The effectiveness part, well, you have to be effective in human rights. That means so many things. But if I can just connect it with the visibility part of my mandate, let me just tell you one thing. And this I explained to the European Parliament, I explained, of course, to the, to the foreign ministers of the EU. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of them uh, liked it and others, you know, were a little surprised because they thought that, uh, you know, as a politician, maybe I would be thinking different, but I don't. I don't intend to try to increase the uh, appearance of effectiveness of our, of our human rights policy by increasing its visibility. I intend to try to increase the visibility by increasing the effectiveness. It's very easy sometimes to just try to be visible, make statements, do events, cleanse your soul, pretend to be present. But in fact, although that may give the impression that Europe is present and that Europe is effective, in fact, in many cases, that is not effectiveness. And I would much rather, for all of us, myself included, doing human rights in Europe around the world, uh, to try to do the ants' work, the difficult work, the uh, stomach-clenching work sometimes of, 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 of little by little uh, engaging and building up true human rights successes than to pretend that I have them when I don't. I think that in order to close this brief introduction, I'd like to mention to you four, maybe five, I'll decide as I go on, major challenges that, um, you know, there are many, uh, that I think that human rights policy around the world for the EU as a whole, and I should say for Ireland in particular, and, I'm, and I'm, so, I'm so pleased that Ireland today has the presidency of the EU and that Ireland got elected to the Human Rights Council, not an easy feat, uh, but also, uh, I was telling some NGOs I met before, it's almost like the EU getting the Nobel Prize. It's the, it, you know, it sounds great. Being elected to the Human Rights Council is great. Uh, but it's the beginning of a difficult process, not the end of it. Now you have to prove that you actually deserve it. You know, that, that Europe deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, that, uh, that Ireland deserves, you know, being at the Human Rights Council. The major challenges. First, shrinking civil society space around the world. If you were to look at anything from... Is, a whole string of laws uh, in uh, some member states uh, of the Council of Europe. If you were to look at the way that a number of African countries deal with uh, NGOs today, how they attempt to um, uh, restrict their funding, uh, restrict their ability to register, uh, restrict or supervise their activities uh, under a number of pretexts, let alone, in many cases, persecute their members, silence them, or in some extreme cases, kill them. All over the world today, we have, I'm sorry, is this my phone? I just apologize. Uh, boy, and it's on silent, but it's still, it's still annoying. Uh, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Shrinking, shrinking NGO space uh, is a major challenge. And that involves for the EU uh, a number of things. The first thing is to think about how it is that we can support NGOs around the world um, and uh, support them, I don't mean financially uh, only, but also in capacity building. There are many 
NGOs that will tell you it's not an issue of funding as much as it is an issue of you telling us uh, how it is that we can best function, uh, how it is that we can best uh, do the reporting we have to, how it is that we can best network in order to be able to promote those issues. And that's the kind of thing we have to do. Second thing we have to do with NGOs, it goes without saying again, uh, is engage them better as the EU. So forget what third countries do. We have NGOs in many countries around the world that we should be talking more to uh, with our you know, embassies on the ground, uh, human rights defenders we should be more visible with, um, engaging more uh, in the neighborhood. We have European neighborhood policies, and there, again, it would be uh, ideal if NGOs could be even more integrated in an official fashion in advising the EU on human rights situations in the country before annual reports on European neighborhood policy get created. Truly be engaged with NGOs as the EU, not simply for the family photo, as it were, but because we honestly believe that we cannot be effective unless we have that sincere engagement. It doesn't mean, and I tell this around the world, I was telling it in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Moscow, uh, not in Moscow, in St. Petersburg a few, a few months ago, uh, when there was a big NGO uh, uh, conference, EU and uh, Russian NGOs. You know, it's, it doesn't, uh, NGOs can be nice if they want to, but I don't have to. It's not their job. Their job is to push the system. In many cases, and in every topic, eventually politically. Because even if I'm an NGO that simply deals, let's say, with the retirees' rights, you know, and I don't do politics, at some point, if a government decides that it's going to reduce the pensions, I have to be involved in trying to convince those people who pass this legislation not to do it. I'm not a political NGO if I do this, but there's always engagement involving politics. So NGOs don't have to be nice. Their job is to actually promote and, pr and protect what they see as fundamental interests for their societies, each in their own field. Now, and no government, of course, is obligated to listen to everything NGOs have to say or to agree with. You can disagree as a government but you're absolutely obligated to ensure that an NGO can engage in that kind of advocacy, can be listened by you as a government, can talk to others around the world about their issues that concern them and their country, and can do all those things without being termed traitors to the country, without being persecuted, without being imprisoned, without being ridiculed, uh, without having their families or friends threatened. And that is the obligation every state has. Second challenge, a major attack around the world today on the universality of human rights. Human rights are universal. That is what everyone who has signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that's virtually every country in the world, says. And at the same time, in the past 10 years, you see a number of arguments developing from all quarters, from all different countries and all different continents. Not a majority argument necessarily, but certainly a development argument that human rights are not universal. That anyone who says that ignores traditional values, ignores the fact that not countries are the same. In fact, it goes even further to portray human rights as a Western construct that was imposed upon other parts of the world who are now rebelling against it. And although everyone who comes with an argument like that, and it could be uh, either to repress women in one country, or not to have fair elections in another, or to violate LGBTI rights in a third, everyone who comes with this argument tends to come very well prepared to promote it. My feeling is that Europe is rusty that we have taken this for granted. In fact, you cannot anymore be going around the world telling people, but of course they're universal because we all signed the Universal Declaration and you agreed to it as well. It's true, it's absolutely true. But there's an argumentation battle happening. And for me, indeed, one of the main reasons that I so look forward to coming 
to a setting like this, sort of a more academic one, if you like, a more think tanking one, was to throw this on the table and to see if you could have some discussions, some debates, to get those European arguments unrusty. In fact, human rights are the universal language of the powerless against the cultural relativism of the powerful. That's what human rights is. You will almost never hear a woman being beaten up by a husband tell you that you have no right to intervene in this because that's cool in her tradition. You will almost always hear the husband tell you that you may not intervene because that's the way that things are done. You will almost never hear a journalist being persecuted or killed in a country say that Europe has no right to intervene, but you will often hear a government say that Europe doesn't get it and shouldn't get involved. Human rights is the language of the powerless against the relativism of the powerful. Human rights is the language of a continent, because Europe also participated when human rights were developed and the universal aggression was developed, of a continent that not only was not trying to impose Western values on anyone, but at the time was telling everyone, please do not do what we did. Do not do what the Western values, values did with Nazism and with genocides. And therefore, we need a context not to promote Western values, but in fact, to ensure that no one makes the mistake that the, that the West made at that time. Human rights is the language that anti-colonial movements used, rightfully so, to get rid of colonialism, that scourge. Anti-colonialism was certainly not a pro-Western battle. It was certainly an anti-Western battle. So anyone around the world today that claims that human rights are not universal should be able to have a battery of arguments to counter that. And I think that we need to be able to think smart on what of all that is true and convincing. Third challenge. Economic and social human rights. I think, I feel that Europe has to be talking more about them around the world. We do not and we need to. First of all, because people in many countries that we go care about them more than anything else. And if you're going to be effective in your human rights argumentation, you have to be trying to address problems that people face, all problems. Secondly, because that gives us greater credibility to be able to continue addressing as we must and we ought to, uh, with vigilance uh, and, uh, in my view, with greater vigilance even today, violations of civil and political rights. But if you go around the world as I have in the past only four months, it feels like four years already, but you know, if you just do that and you go and you talk to people, many times, either openly or more politely on their side, they will tell you, you know what, you're absolutely right to point out that in many of our countries, you know, we violate, uh, you know, NGO rights and we ought to do something about this. And democracy certainly is not working as right as it should and all that. But at the same time, you know, freedom of expression and the internet, big issue, we get it. But you have resolved in Europe the issue of food and the issue of shelter, more or less. And in our countries, these are hugely unresolved issues. So. Can you tell us something about those human rights? And not just tell us something in terms of finger pointing, but tell us something in terms of things you could give to us, transfer to us, capacity, uh, development aid, other things that could help us address those issues. And indeed, I think that Europe has nothing to be embarrassed or afraid of when it comes to economic and social rights. On the contrary, I think of all the continents in the world, we are, the EU is the biggest you know, safety net social safety net provider that exists uh, today. Uh, our labor rights are particularly advanced. Uh, you know, our health uh, and education systems are particularly advanced. And out of decades of experience, of changes, of, of doubts, I mean, it's not as if we have reached the pinnacle. There's all the debate. But we have that expertise. And there are countries around the world that could use that expertise, and we have it. 
And we have something else as well. We're the biggest donor of developmental aid around the world today, by far. About 55% or 6%, I forget, of developmental aid around the world today is European aid, EU member states, and of course, and EU centrally. We don't call that humanitarian aid, but it is. It can be. Its effects, if it breaks poverty cycles, if it gets women in the labor force, if it builds better schools and better hospitals, its effects are both economic and social right effects and civil and political right effects. It's humanitarian aid extraordinaire. But there, of course, we have a big debate that is a fair one, and we're having it, we should have it more. You know, what strings attached do you bring to an aid like this? Do you, should you make sure that you have an impact assessment on human rights before you just give it? Should you, even if you give it, make sure that you try to monitor as much as you can objectively through indicators if human rights issues are getting better or worse in the country, give the aid to, et cetera, et cetera? And is it your obligation? My, I believe yes. Final challenge. You realize there are a thousand challenges, right? I just say four. There are many more, but I have to, I have to you know, be very you know, succinct for this. Um, it is indeed the way that we conduct our human rights discussions with third countries. Europe has the EU about 40, 40 plus human rights dialogues a year with different countries or different regions, or regional organizations, the African Union, for example. I, I conducted that dialogue a couple of months ago. And there are two things, there are many things. There, there, there are a couple of things I think we have to do a little different. Uh, and that, if you like, also will give you, in ties with things I said before. We have to be very strong in our discussions with foreign countries on human rights violations when they exist, especially in civil and political rights. I think those who say, yeah, but you know, they may get upset if we actually push that too much. It's not really right. Let's be smarter and all that stuff. I'm making a big mistake. I think many countries around the world appreciate you, in fact, if you are consistent and uh, consistent in raising issues um, and being, uh, even if you are actually uh, unpleasant about them. What they do not appreciate or respect that much, if you're wishy-washy, if they sense, you know, that you can be in some cases really tough when you don't need that country's money or investments, but in other cases you can be pretty, you know, lax or forget the human rights discussion because, you know, uh, you know, that you have many things to sell there. That no one respects. They know you're not, they, you cannot be taken seriously. At the same time, we have to be much smarter in engaging with our partners in a true dialogue. And I believe we can do a lot more than we're doing today to do that. A true dialogue is useful. It increases our credibility in those discussions. It creates an atmosphere and a climate in which perhaps some of our suggestions or criticisms can be listened to a little more calmly by the other side. Uh, it can also allow us to be helpful as opposed to just accusatory. If you look at countries around the world today, some countries, for example, for which uh, civil political rights, freedom of expression, all that stuff are anathema, you can also look that, that they're dying to get some dialogue going and expertise on other rights, such as labor rights, because their economies are developing and they're having suddenly strikes. And they want to be able to deal with that kind of you know, right out there. Um, environmental rights. Uh, and how civil society can actually play a hugely important role in flagging those things to governments who otherwise don't have a system in place. But when an environmental crisis breaks out, their people, even in authoritarian societies, can get extremely upset with their ineffective governments. So there's a lot of major issues in which we can engage with countries around the world. And we have not done as effectively as I think we should have to date. We have to find, in other words, as I said before, issues that their people care about in addition to issues that we care about and our people care about. So human rights dialogue should not simply be about posturing. We should not simply be going around being pressured by our own public opinions to come out and say, yes, of course I talked to that country and I told them that they're terrible here, terrible there, terrible there. 
And many times our press and our public opinions demand that of us primarily. But that is not really how you can be most effective. You have to do that. You have to be, as I said, firm, but that's not the only thing. Second thing we have to do is we have to engage them in, it seems to me, big countries, difficult countries, in a broader debate than just the bilateral. If you think of discussions that you can have with a number of major countries around the world, and I have had, I've conducted some dialogues up to now, and you think of, you know, uh, you take the, uh, you know, what's happening with human rights uh, after the Arab Spring? This is an issue that the Chinese, the Russians, the Mexicans, the Germans, the Greeks, the South Africans, everyone could be fascinated and interested in. In the human rights dialogue, you should be able to engage in the, that kind of exchange as well. And let me close with a third thing. My mandate is absolutely a third thing relating to those dialogues and their interaction. My mandate explicitly says that I have nothing to do, I cannot get engaged in human rights in the 27 EU member states. So I do human rights in the EU's foreign policy. The fact is that anyone who's conducted any human rights dialogue with any country around the world knows that after we go ahead with listing the issues that we find troubling, they usually turn around and start beginning increasingly raising issues they find troubling in us or they want explanations for. What's happening with the Roma here? What's happening with racism there? Uh, you know, and racist violence. What's happening with the police brutality there? What's happening with the prisons here? Now, the way we have dealt with those issues in the past mostly is to say, uh, well, thank you for raising the question, but frankly, this is not EU competence. So, you know, if you have an, a question to ask, why don't you just go ahead and call the relevant European go uh, you know, government and, and, and ask them directly. But that is not a human rights dialogue anymore. It's the EU going and saying 10 things from which you expect answers, but then when the question is asked about EU member states and situations, the answer is, well, I'm not going to tell you anything about that. It's not my business. I think we have to be much more engaged in third countries, and in fact, we have nothing to be embarrassed about, on our own member states and Europe's human rights record. We have to be able to tell them precisely what it is that we've done to make things good in this continent when, in fact, they're not good virtually everywhere else. Because that's basically what Europe is in human rights. I hate to sound a little arrogant about this, but we are at the forefront. But my arrogance, quote unquote, is not one stemming from a sense of perfection. It's an arrogance stemming from the knowledge of imperfection. I know that we are not perfect in Europe. Heck, for seven years, as a Vice President of the European Parliament, I mostly spent attention in attacking European governments and the Commission on what I felt were major violations of fundamental rights that were happening in Europe. The point is not to be perfect. The point is to have the system in place, the debate in place, the willingness to interact in place without feeling a threat for doing so to make sure that you can identify problems and try to fix them. And that is what is missing in so many countries and parts of the world today. And I think that even if we are able to achieve that little in the next few years, to infuse more of that understanding and spirit and institutions that can do that job, uh, it would be in and of itself uh, enough uh, um, success. Uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you.